Thank you very much, Ruan, Johan, Marith, and everyone who made this possible. It's a wonderful opportunity to share one's experiences with other conservationists and life scientists and, and everyone else with an interest in that topic. I think unlocking nature is a, a fantastic concept. After all, uh, whether we are researchers or conservationists or policy makers, our role is to unlock nature, understand her mechanisms, and then to learn to live uh, within her limits. So congratulations on this initiative and it's a great pleasure for me to participate. I've been asked to talk about my career um, initially as an ichthyologist, but um, increasingly as a conservationist. It's based on my autobiography, When I Was a Fish, Tales of an Ichthyologist. And I came across, I thought up this title when I remembered a quotation by Jean-Jacques, uh, jean Cousteau, the famous um, French scuba diver. He said, if you want to understand a fish, you've got to become a fish. And that's what I tried to do during my career. So from an early age, and there's a little sketch of me uh, when I was about 10 years old uh, by my father. I, I grew up in East London and I had the good fortune to meet Dr. Marjorie Courtney Latimer, uh, a pioneering naturalist um, who was then curator of the East London Museum. And we stayed in contact throughout our lives. Um, as a young man, I, I spent a great deal of time outdoors especially in the intertidal zone and in, in local rivers and so on, and also on excursions uh, into terrestrial biomes. And a friend of mine at that time was Graham Avery. Uh, he, we were at school together throughout our school careers, and we are still in contact now in, in retirement. Uh, he became Ezeko's uh, leading um, paleoanthropologist. So I then went on to Rhodes University, uh, where I studied zoology, entomology, and also took an art subject, anthropology, because I've always been interested in the human dimension of our uh, relationship uh, with nature. And I've retained that interest in anthropology throughout my career. I wasn't a particularly good student. I enjoyed life. And it was only uh, from my honors year onwards that I'd start to take things uh, really seriously. And at the end of my honors year, um, having been on a number of expeditions organized by Rhodes University to Northern Zilliland, I was offered a position um, as a fish researcher at the Lake Sabaya Research Station, which you know, uh, Rhodes had established on the shores of South Africa's largest natural freshwater lake up in um, Maputaland between St. Lucia and Cozy Bay. And there I spent six and a half very productive years doing my MSc and then my PhD on the freshwater fishes, not only of Lake Sabaya, but of Maputland, also southern Mozambique and, and further north. Uh, there are some photos of Lake Sabaya as it was um, in the early 1970s uh, when I was there, a very healthy, although oligotrophic lake. And one of the puzzles about it was that we noticed that the most common uh, fishes such as the Mozambique tilapia and the sharp toothed catfish were stunted in this lake. And I was basically plonked on the shores of this, of Lake Sabaya and told to find out why are they stunted. My mentor was uh, Professor Brian Allenson. We had a wonderful relationship throughout our lives. Uh, we remained friends for another 57 years uh, until he died just two months ago and I'm actually writing his obituary right now. So there's our young family, my wife top right, Carolyn, who's a keen photographer, and our sons, Craig and Ryan, and daughter, Tracy, would follow later. And Tracy is currently a, a field guide up in Timbavati. So I did a detailed study of the Mozambique tilapia, and I basically found that um, their main food resource, which is diatoms, was most abundant uh, in shallow water. And it therefore made sense for the fish to be small um, throughout most of their lives, to breed early and have a very short lifespan. And this led me into studies on phenotypic plasticity in fishes, 
because uh, I found that the same species just uh, 80 kilometers away in Yamiki Plan in Nduma Game Reserve grows to three and a half kilograms, whereas in Lake Sabaya, they hardly ever uh, were larger than 200 um, to 300 grams. So it was a great introduction, not only to field work, but to starting to unravel the mysteries of nature. And my experience at Lake Sabaya was my little voyage of the Beagle, where it exposed me to new environments, new opportunities, and it was a great uh, grounding. The fish on which I did my PhD was Clarius caripinus, the sharp-toothed catfish. And I was fortunate to have chosen the, the tilapia and the catfish because both of them are very important in the world today uh, as uh, aquaculture species. And in the case of uh, the sharp-toothed catfish, also as a dangerous invader. And the other the three photographs there were the first photographs ever taken of the, the breeding uh, behavior of the sharp-toothed catfish in the natural environment. And my studies were the first ever done on these species in a natural environment and continue to be cited today. I also did a lot of work informally on hippos, crocs, um, aquatic birds and uh, anthropology. I, I studied the um, traditional ways of fishing of the Amatonga people. And I compiled this in a book called Studies on the Ecology of Maputland, which I co-edited with Keith Cooper, then head of the Wildlife Society. And I really recommend this approach to other scientists. You know, in addition to publishing your peer reviewed papers in scientific journals and so on, publish your informal observations as well, because this book is now a standard reference um, on the ecology of Maputland. And I'm so glad we took the trouble uh, to record our observations. For instance, I made a large collection of reptiles for Wolf Harker at the Transvaal Museum, and we co authored a chapter in there. And, um, a lot of other stuff which would otherwise have gone unrecorded in the popular literature. And in fact, that book led to another book when I moved back to the Eastern Cape, a field guide to the Eastern Cape coast, which had a strong coverage of conservation. And this was co-edited with uh, Roy Lutka and Fred Guess. And this book has subsequently been extended um, in collaboration with Aurini de Moor uh, to the Southern Cape coast as well. Sadly, since we left Lake Sabaya at the end of the IBP program, <clears throat> the lake has gone seriously downhill. Um, the water level has dropped over 10 meters. Um, it's been invaded by um, in, um, alien snails. <clears throat> it's become eutrophic in part. And what is, was one of Africa's best known lakes as a result of the extensive research we've done there is being seriously neglected. And I don't think that within the Isi Mangalisa Wetland Park, it's given enough attention. While I was at Sabaya, Chris Appleton and I also did a study on the mangrove swamp at Sordoana Bay, and we found that the old bridge, top left, uh, was interfering with water flow and killing off the mangrove uh, forest. So we campaigned to Natal Parks Board, as they were at the time, and they built this new bridge, uh, which helped to restore the mangroves. We also studied uh, the nearby Pongola floodplain and uh, many years later uh, with uh, my student from Michigan, uh, Glenn Merrin, with a very large tilapia, um, Oreochromis mozambicus, and on the right, a typical trawl catch, uh, which included a little crocodile. After my work at Lake Sabaya, I went to the British Museum Natural History. Now, this wasn't actually my choice initially. At the end of my time at Sabaya, we were visited by Professor uh, Harold Scioli from the Max Planck Institute in Germany, who was doing research on the Amazon River. And he invited me um, to do postdoctoral research on the Tatinga River um, in the Amazon. I was dead keen to do that. But Professor Allen said, said no way. You know, you've had enough time in the bush. We're gonna send you to one of the great museums where you can sort of rub shoulders with top scientists and uh, become, you know, mature yourself in terms of your overall knowledge. So off I went to the BMNH and it turned out to be an absolutely fantastic experience. Attending uh, meetings of the Royal Society, the Royal Geographical Society, the Linnaean Society. My laboratory was right next to 
uh, that of my mentor, Dr. Humphrey Greenwood, who is head of the freshwater fish section. And there I met people like Sir Peter Scott and David Attenborough. And uh, it was just an absolutely wonderful eye-opening experience for a boyki from the Eastern Cape. So there's our young family at the end of, uh, more or less at the end of that time. Um, I then moved to back to Grahamstown, Makanda. And initially I was senior lecturer in ichthyology um, and fishery science in what is now the South African Institute for Aquatic Biodiversity, SIAB. Um, I took over from Margaret Smith as the second director of that institute. And one of our achievements during my directorship was a major revision of the famous Smith Sea Fishes book. But we also initiated many other projects, all of which had a link to conservation. When I took over uh, the institute, it had 12 staff. Here, just a few years later, you can see how the staff has grown. And we also formed the Department of Ichthyology and Fishery Science at Rhodes University and the Institute and uh, the department work cl uh, closely together. One of the first things I did when I joined the Ichthyology Institute was to reinitiate research on the coelacanth. It was the person after whom the Institute is named, J.L.B. Smith, was the scientist who, who named um, the first living coelacanth uh, found off East London uh, in December 1938. He called it Latimeria Chalumni after Dr. Marjorie Courtney Latimer. Um, and I was determined that we would initiate a, a program on the, uh, the, the life, the biology of these fishes. And at that time, the main population was in Grand Comore. So we organized five expeditions to the Comores uh, to study the coelacan. Um, and with my interest in traditional fishing methods, we've made a detailed study of the fishermen who go out to sea. This, this fisherman is over a depth of probably about 800 meters, although he's close to shore uh, in his um, dugout canoe with double outriggers. And they're mainly targeting oil fish uh, using hand lines, uh, but they occasionally catch coelacanths by accident. Our first task was to um, look at coelacanth specimens that were held in the weirdest of places, in hotels, in fishery schools, um, and also here, the local diver, um, John Louis Giraud. I, I visited him and I said, I believe you have a coelacanth specimen, where is it? And he said, oh, it's under my bed. And he hauled out this dried specimen, which we measured up. We also found that the local Japanese fishermen um, recorded their catches of coelacanths using a geotoko method whereby you actually paint the fish and then you drape a white fabric over it and rub it and great detail of the fish uh, is revealed and then the data is written onto that geotaco. And in fact, I have in my lounge a geotaco of, of a coelacanth that I, I made using that technique. I just to summarize, uh, I'm not talking a lot about the coelacanth in this talk because I will be dealing with that uh, later in Share Screen Africa, but the first coelacanth, uh, known to Western science, was caught in East South Africa in 1938. And this was a great surprise to the scientific community because this group of fishes was thought to have gone extinct during the great Cretaceous extinction 65 million years ago, uh, when most of the large dinosaurs uh, died out. And the coelacan fossil record ends then as well. So it was perfectly logical to conclude that they had gone extinct along with over 70% of other um, large uh, bony animals. Then uh, the second one was found after a long search by JLB and Margaret Smith in the Comores in 1952. Um, the first live sighting uh, was by a French scientist, Milo, in 1987 on Anjouan Island. And then coelacan started to pop up along the east coast of Africa in Mozambique, in Madagascar, and surprise, surprise, another species of living coelacanth, Latimeria monadoensis, who was found in Indonesia on the other side of the Indian Ocean. And then uh, the remarkable discovery, uh, initially by mixed gas divers, of a coelacanth population living in the Isimangalisa wetland park in South Africa. And they were subsequently found in Kenya and Tanzania, and have now also been um, they, they, we now think that their main population is in fact in Madagascar. Uh, a colleague and I recently published a paper on the conservation status of coelacanths in Madagascar, and we predict that that will be the main population. And I'm currently working on a similar paper on the coelacanths of Tanzania. 
During our coelacanth research, we were most fortunate to meet up with Professor Dr. Hans Fricker uh, from the Max Planck Institute, a world famous um, diver, scuba diver, who also has made extensive use of research submersibles. And on the right, you can see his first research submersible, the GEO, named after the famous uh, geographical magazine. We sponsored him. And in the background, an underwater habitat. And this scene was photographed in the Red Sea where he was doing trials uh, with the geo. He subsequently took the geo to the Comores uh, to look for coelacanths, but she could only penetrate to 200 meters, which wasn't deep enough. So he developed a second submersible, the Jago, which could go to 400 meters. And with that, over the next 26 years, did some of the most remarkable research on the living coelacanth. And there you can see one of his motherships and uh, the Jago stowed um, near the stern and then top left underwater. Now we worked very closely with the Comoran fishermen to identify sites where coelacanths might live. And in fact, for some time, uh, Hunts dived and dived and couldn't find a coelacanth and then consulted with the fishermen and they, they laughed at him. He said, they said, why are you diving during the day? Coelacanths sleep during the day and hunt at night. So Hunts and his team then went off diving at night and immediately found coelacanths and most of their subsequent uh, dives were done after dark. And I was fortunate to take part in, in dives and there we are top left, uh, Jürgen Schauer, the pilot, and myself about to go down, Hans Fricker wishing us well. And on this occasion, we went into a cave off the south coast of Grand Comore. And here I am at a depth of 198 meters looking out the window and what you see is um, the very well camouflaged tail of a coelacanth uh, deep down in this cave. Uh, there were in fact five coelacanths in that cave and we spent several hours with them. And it was a life-changing experience, basically. You felt you were going back several hundred million years of seeing uh, life in the ocean on our planet um, long before even the dinosaurs evolved, let alone humans who came on the scene. Coelacanth is a beautiful fish, it's quite large. Females grow up to two meters and 100 kilograms, males are smaller. And as you can see, it has this brilliant blue body, body uh, with a pattern of white spots. And very fortunately, from the research point of view, the pattern of white spots on each coelacanth is unique. So it's a kind of fingerprint. So we have been able to study individual coelacanths. And in Hans's case, he followed some individuals for over 25 years. Um, and this has been uh, remarkably useful. It, it's it's a, a fish that's totally unique. It has a potpourri of characters um, similar to bony fishes, some characteristics of sharks, um, even some char characteristics of tetrapods. It has eight fins, including a huge tail fin, and a unique feature is the extra lobe in the middle of the tail fin. Unlike most predators, coelacanths are social animals, so they gather in caves in groups at night, I mean during the day and then hunt at night. And here's their very unusual head stand that they use when they're looking for prey, which is mainly fishes and, and crabs um, under the sand. They do a head stand, they bend their tail back and forth, and we now know that that middle lobe of the tail fin is part of the electrosensitive system to detect uh, the electrical fields of prey at night under the sand. Coelacanths are actually very docile fish and Hans and his team were able to go right up close and with the robotic arm, uh, remove scales and even implant tags on the fish uh, as shown on the left. And then on the right, Jürgen and I are removing some tissue from the first coelacanth in East London uh, for later DNA analysis. Um, we published our work extensively in the scientific and popular literature. On the left is a book, The Biology of Latin Marriage Alumni and the Evolution of Coelacanths, which remains the most comprehensive volume on the species. And Hunt has also published a very readable, popular account of his uh, research. In 1991, we raised funds to bring Jago, or sorry, Geo to South Africa um, or, and dived off the Eastern Cape Coast. And this um, video was made by the SATV at the time. And after that, I was employed um, at the Two Oceans Aquarium, where I had many involvements in conservation and research, a marvelous few years. And one of them 
uh, was with the Ramsar Convention, the C Convention on uh, Wetlands of International Importance. I was appointed onto the Scientific and Technical Review Panel of Ramsar and attended many of their meetings. And I was subsequently contracted to draw up the criteria that we use for the declaration of Ramsar sites um, based on their fish and fisheries, the importance of their fish and fisheries. So I drew up these um, draft uh, conventions. They were approved eventually by the committee and then presented at the Conference of the Parties in Melbourne. And uh, since then, they've been used as a criteria for the declaration of wetlands based on fish and fishery. That was a, a very rewarding little exercise. But while I was at the aquarium, we also brought the Jago to South Africa, diving off the Western Cape coast and off um, Cape Point. And we were able to go deeper than research scientists had ever gone uh, before along that coast. And just uh, some examples of photograph here, uh, we're playing with a robotic arm with a large monkfish at the depth of 350 meters. Uh, after playing around with it, we let it go. We decided not to catch it. And there, uh, at a depth of 100 meters, much deeper than they were thought to live, uh, some West Coast rock, rock lobsters. We even encountered a Cape Fur seal at 165 meters. Quite remarkable that they can go that deep. Uh, South Africa issued four uh, postage stamps on our silicon research in 1989. And these were only the third. Um, stamps to commemorating a scientific event um, issued by South Africa. Uh, subsequently, uh, and, and in fact before that, 26 countries around the world have issued postage stamps depicting the coelacanth. Um, while I was at the Ichthyology Institute and subsequently, we, we mounted a major research program on the Okavango Delta in Botswana. In fact, we had teams of students there off and on for a period of 17 years and uh, produced the most authoritative book on that uh, quite remarkable system, which is a World Heritage Site. And there's the small team that started it all on, from left to right, Paul Skelton, uh, Tiny, uh, myself and Glenn Merrin from Michigan. Um, the Okavango, as I'm sure all of you know, is an incredibly complex system with a, a river coming in from the northwest, a, a permanent swamp and a temporary swamp, extremely changeable, thrilling to study, but extremely difficult to, to you know, get a handle on. Um, but I think over our 17 year period, we, we did a, a reasonably good job. We also included uh, studies on the Chobe River up in northeastern Botswana. And here's a typical uh, meeting around a campfire. We didn't have sophisticated facilities at all. Uh, you know, we'd, we'd, we'd live and work in environments like this for weeks on end. And going from left to right, I'm there with the, the leather peak cap. And in, in front of me is Humphrey Greenwood, head of the freshwater fish section from the Natural History Museum in London. Behind the table at the back is Dr. Ilan Paperna, who I'm sure Liesel remembers, um, the famous uh, Israeli fish par parasitologist. Leaning down doing a dissection is Glenn Merrin. And then um, on the right is Dr. Hans Peters and his wife from Germany. So we were able to take some top scientists on these expeditions uh, to help us with our research, with collections and identifications. We also included Lake and Garmi in the study. Uh, when Livingston, um, David Livingston visited Lake Ngami in the middle 1800s, it was a large lake over 200 square meters. In 1982, when on one of our visits to it, it was less than half a square kilometer in area. And here I am in a, in a sort of mud bath of, of mainly uh, catfish, but there were in fact a few crocodiles in there as well. And around this remaining bit of water, there were tens of thousands of um, catfish skulls. Uh, these had been stranded by the receding water and they were being fed on by marabou stalks and even hyenas. So this is the book that we produced. It's a, a, a small book, but it packs a big punch uh, covering 85 uh, species of freshwater fishes known from the Akavanga Delta and the Chobe River. And one of the most interesting things we found is you know, you, that one needs to 
measure biodiversity, not just by counting species, but also by looking at the number of genera and the different um, life history styles and breeding strategies. Um, there are um, 26 different breeding guilds of fishes among the 86 odd species of fishes in the Okavango Delta. Um, if you compare that with Lake Malawi, which has over 800 species of fish, but only three breeding guilds. You know, so one must be careful when you count biodiversity just as a number of species. There are many other criteria that should be used. Um, right about this time, I um, established a museum, an angling museum in Neisner, which uh, covered not only modern, but also traditional uh, fishing methods and had a strong um, conservation orientation. For instance, we highlighted and promoted conservation techniques uh, in angling, such as biodegradable nylon, the use of uh, barbless hooks, um, catch and return, uh, tagging programs, etc. And this museum still exists today, not very big, uh, but it's created a lot of interest. Around about this time, I met uh, Professor Eugene Ballon from the University of Guelph in Canada. He had previously worked in Czechoslovakia, where he was one of the leading ichthyologists in East Africa, in, in Eastern Europe. Uh, he then embarked on a field study on Lake Kariba from the northern shores in Zambia and produced some definitive works on the fishes of, of Lake Kariba. Uh, he subsequently um, jumped uh, the bench, as it were, and um, moved to uh, Canada, USA, and then Canada, um, where he was accepted as, as a leading scientist um, at the University of Guelph and started publishing a journal, Environmental Biology of Fishes. Um, I submitted a paper to his journal, and he found it very interesting. He contacted me, invited me to do research with him, and that resulted in a collaboration that lasted for over 25 years. Um, his field of research was the breeding guilds of fishes. And, and, and very basically, there are three groups of breeding guilds, like non-guarders who release the sperm and eggs into the open environment and do not guard them. They are the guarders which make nests and offer some protection to the eggs and young. And then there are the bearers, um, which are internal bearers and give birth uh, to live young like mammals. And here you can see among the fishes, we have non-guarders, guarders and bearers, as we do among, among amphibians and reptiles. In the birds, they're only guarders. There are no non-guarders or bearers. And in the mammals, uh, there are guarders, uh, as in the marsupials, and mostly bearers. He also worked on what he called the yin and yang of fishes, and that is the, the embryology, the early development of fishes is, um, can be put into two groups. One, indirect development, where there is a larva present between the embryo and the juvenile, and then direct development, where the embryo develops straight into a juvenile and then into an adult. And, you know, this may seem very simplistic, but it's incredible what predictive power it has and how it enables one to understand the biology of a fish and also to conserve it. Just to give you an example, and my research then extended beyond fishes to look at the uh, life history styles of uh, other um, groups of animals. Animals with larvae, in other words, indirect development, include butterflies, moths, bees, beetles, barnacles, various amphibians, among the fishes, eels and tarpons, birds that hatch as naked chicks, and mammals that produce naked young, such as kangaroos and rabbits. And um, these typically, um, the larvae often have temporary organs, and each life stage is in fact a different ecological species uh, within the life cycle. And uh, these trends are less marked in the higher vertebrates. So examples of animals without larvae, in other words, direct development. These are species without a metamorphosis. Among the fishes, cichlids are an example. Among the birds, birds that lay large eggs with dense yolk, and I've given examples there. And then among the mammals, those that give birth to furred young with open eyes that soon run. So, you know, these, these were, we started to work with uh, people in other animal groups and the trends that came out were absolutely fascinating. Um, 
we divided the breeding strategies of fishes and other animals into two groups, opportunistic or altricial and the prudential or precocial. And there you can see uh, the general trends, opportunistic ones, high number of eggs, small, a larval stage present, mortality rates high, etc. And we were able to quantify all these trends and the opposite suite of characters among the prudentials. Then um, these are some um, further um, information. The opportunistic ones are faster breeding rate, high number, small eggs, yolk density, and, and more and more characters started to fit into this uh, uh, template. And we also looked at feeding preferences, species diversity, level of speciation, specialization, adaptability, etc. Um, and you know, when we compared our research in the Okavango Delta, which is a, a very variable system versus Lake Malawi, which is a very stable system, we were able to show a complete separation of these character traits um, of fishes and other animals. And there's uh, more, more examples, um, unpredictable environments um, like Okavango, relatively a low species diversity, high number of breeding guilds, many, uh, uh, sorry, low number of mutualisms and sy symbioses, fewer rare species, many migratory ones, and species rates, speciation rates and extinction rates low, and in contrast to in the predictable environments such as Lake Malawi. Uh, we call this um, alternative life history styles or theory, and we subsequently found that it was of application in aquaculture, in biodiversity conservation, management of alien species, fisheries and game management, and ecological research. So our initial basic science research on these alternative life history styles uh, found many uh, practical applications. And just as an example, um, if one looks at the life history traits of threatened animals, which are mainly precocial species, these, this is typical the, trait, uh, the, the suite of traits that they have, rare large individual size, high in the food pyramid, low dispersal rates, few young per breeding, uh, et cetera, et cetera. Now, this isn't always a hard and fast rule, but it is a general trend, which we found repeated uh, through many different animal groups. We subsequently organized an international conference on the alternative life history styles of animals. So not only fishes, but other vertebrates and also invertebrates. And there you can see some of our invited speakers. And I see people there from Germany, uh, the USA, um, England, Israel, Switzerland, um, Canada, uh, and elsewhere. We published a book, Alternative Life History Styles of Animals, and another one uh, specifically on fishes. And one of the things that came out of this work, uh, which Eugene Ballon and I were very keen on, is to look at coelacanth breeding. Because although coelacanths are ancient fishes with a fossil record going back 420 million years, and they have a very conservative external anatomy, which is recognizable throughout their fossil record, we found that they have a very advanced breeding method, almost as advanced as that of mammals. They produce the largest eggs of any fish, the size of an orange, and just a few dozen eggs compared with the tens of thousands or even millions that some other fishes uh, produce. They give birth to large juveniles, um, which are fed inside the mother from um, food and nutrients in a yolk sac. And when these juveniles are born, they're 33 centimeters long and 500 grams in weight. So they're really functional little predators with fully functional teeth, um, ready to, to strike out into the world. Now, it's sadly, it seems that pregnant coelacanths are quite vulnerable uh, to um, the net catches, trawl and gill net catches. And on the top left is a coelacanth, uh, which was caught off Mozambique, which was found to be pregnant. It had 36 late term uh, yolk sac juveniles in it. And the one on the right is ta from Tanzania, which had even more late term uh, juveniles, but at least it did give us material to study. But the remarkable thing about coelacanth breeding is this method of um, uh, live bearing uh, with uh, yolk sac juveniles hatching at a very advanced stage of development uh, it has been found in the fossil record in fossils over 200 million years old. Uh, 
So um, this method of live bearing was well developed um, long before it was uh, became uh, specialized among the mammals. Only one this is juvenile coelacanth has ever been photographed in the wild. And uh, this is a, a little juvenile um, in Indonesia, although two uh, dead juveniles have been found uh, on the water surface in the Comores. So we still have a lot to find out about where the juveniles live um, and what they feed on. And what something that intrigues me, and I'd love to find out is, do coelacanths guard their young? Which would be relatively um, unexpected in a predator, but the coelacanth has thrown up so many um, sort of curved balls that I wouldn't be surprised if it is an example of a predator that does guard its young. We mounted a, a campaign in the Comores to conserve coelacanths because the Japanese were trying to catch them uh, for display in aquaria. Uh, top left, Karin Hisman is painting a sign, let them be where they are, showing a coelacanth uh, in a trap. And we were successful in this initiative because a living coelacanth had never been caught on purpose, although we could do it now if we really wanted to. But perhaps most importantly, we got the Comorian people and the president on the, of the Comores on our side. The coelacanth has now been uh, proclaimed as a sacred animal and the, and the Comorians take great pride um, in conserving it. It's listed on Schedule 1 of CITES. Uh, it's regarded as um, vulnerable to extinction and is in the red data list. So it's now well protected. A big question that came up, especially because I was working at an aquarium at the time, is should we keep a coelacanth in captivity? I personally believe from our knowledge of its behavior that it's perfectly possible to catch one and keep it alive in captivity. But the question is, is it ethical? And we don't think it is. And we do not advise it. And that is generally the feeling in the aquarium community internationally. Why would we want to do it? Well, there are certain aspects of their biology, uh, which we will never find out in the wild, which we could uh, better study in captivity. Where? Well, that's a, an open question. When? Uh, hopefully never. Something else that's interested me is so-called cultural history of the coelacanth, the many ways in which it's been depicted in works of art and craft. Bottom left is a coelacanth made out of used tea bags. On the right is a stainless steel model, and you can see a man inside the coelacanth uh, symbolizing the relationship between humans and these ancient fishes. Um, I've published uh, quite extensively on the coelacanth story. Uh, as um, Ryan mentioned, the uh, Fishy Smiths is a biography of the Smiths. I also wrote a biography of Marjorie Courtney Latimer, uh, who lived a remarkable life. Top left is a popular book on the coelacanth. Along the bottom is uh, the annotated old forelegs and which we republished J.L.B. Smith's famous book, Top Right, uh, which was, first came out in 1956. And in the annotated old forelegs, the entire old forelegs book is reproduced with notes in the margins and new chapters at the beginning and the end, which bring the story up to date. Another, uh, just for interest at the aquarium, there I am with the Duke of Edinburgh, um, explaining to him how a, a flush toilet works. Uh, he probably knew, uh, but this was um, you know, during a time when I was, Kada Asmal had appointed me as the head of his 2020 Vision for Water project, and we were publicizing low flush toilets, and doing water audits in thousands of schools and so on. So that was a, a fun initiative at the time. Also, when I was at the aquarium, Carolyn and I had an opportunity to travel on the QE2, uh, the Cunard liner at the time from Cape Town to Southampton. And I was required to ten, give 10 one hour lectures to the passengers um, and also uh, after hours chat to them about marine issues. I then had an opportunity some years later to work in Bahrain, uh, where I was charged with starting a new science center. Bahrain is an absolutely fabulous country. It's an island um, uh, off the coast of Saudi Arabia to the north of the UAE. Um, and there's the science center that I helped to start. I was there for three and a quarter years and developed a whole variety of um, education programs. I used every means possible to travel around on the water and to also study uh, the traditional ways of catching fishes. 
and frequently visited the fish market and introduced dissections uh, to the Science Center. And amazingly, not a single Bahraini who came to the Science Center uh, had ever done a dissection before. So this was a real eye opener. And we subsequently went to Abu Dhabi and other Emirates uh, to do uh, these sort of demonstrations. And there's the, the farewell party after I left uh, the Bahrain Science Center. And interestingly, it's, uh, its brief has now been expanded and it's not just a science center, it's called the Bahrain Science Center for the SDGs. So it's focusing on the United Nations uh, Sustainable Development Goals. Whenever Carol and I go on holiday, she um, you know, sensibly relaxes next to the pool, but I do research on stuff and give talks. And here I am in Mauritius giving a talk about the dodo. One of the concepts that I developed during my, my career was the so-called education value chain. And that is that it's not enough to just convey information to people. You've got to con convert that information into knowledge, which is con contextualized information. And then the next step after that is that that knowledge has to be turned into wisdom, whereby you use it to make good decisions. And that wisdom can lead to a changed mindset, changed behavior, and then finally, influencing others to change their mindset and behavior. And I believe that unless our education programs go along that whole value chain, we haven't achieved our objectives. Carolyn and I uh, have a habit of spending our holidays on islands, uh, especially Zanzibar. And there I did another study on the traditional uh, fish traps, visited the fish markets. Sadly, you can see they catch crayfish and berry there and sell them at the market. And I expanded that research into other African countries. There you can see a, a top left, a raffia palm raft, a bark raft on the right, dugout canoes, uh, different kinds of traditional fishing traps. And I argue in a recent book of mine that we need to put as much effort into conserving these traditional fishing methods as we do into conserving the fishes, because these methods catch fish sustainably uh, in contrast to modern gear such as nylon gill nets. There's a fishing rod from Vilanculus made out of a lala palm. Um, giant um, traps made, uh, used on the Congo River. A floating Zimbabwe visit village in Malawi and Lake Shiri. And there's the book that I published um, on this topic, which has generated a lot of interest. I also recently published a book, Curious Notions, Reflections of an Imagineer, which is a series of essays of my different involvements uh, in science and technology. And one of the points that I look at there is the relationship between science and art, because I found that many people are turned off by the scientific method, uh, the scientific message. They find science too technical and they don't listen to the voice of science. And what I'm doing uh, in collaboration with artists, musicians, uh, actors, is using art to convey the scientific message. And then um, end with a comment on my latest book, Harambi, The Spirit of Innovation in Africa, which has several chapters on terrestrial, marine and freshwater conservation. And it's basically the first overview of innovation throughout what I call the bright continent. And just one of the arguments that I pursue in this book is that humanity is at the crossroads. We are the most numerous large animals ever. Our ability to manipulate the environment is you know, unprecedented and we've exceeded the planet's ability to compensate for our action or meet our needs. We arose from and survived through a biological process, but we are no longer part of wild nature. We are servants of our machines trapped in unsustainable urban environments. We're the first animal to domesticate itself and lose its ecological niche. And we've evolved from hunter-gatherers to pastoralists to shopper industrialists and information fetishists, whereas we should have evolved into the custodians of the biosphere. We're an integral part of nature. We're a valuable species, but not a superior one. And every living thing has a right to live or at least to struggle to live. And this right is not dependent on its actual or potential use to humans. It's dependent on its role in nature. And I conclude that we are the misfits in nature at the moment and point out that evolution by natural selection 
as a mechanism for kicking out the misfits. It's called extinction. And we should not regard ourselves as immune to extinction. Now, Klaus Schwab, a uh, famous economist, has suggested that we're in the fourth industrial revolution. But I argue, I'm just a retired fisherman, so I can't really compete with a world famous uh, economist. But I argue we are in the first post industrial revolution and that it's a collaborative revolution that will solve some of the problems created by the first three industrial revolutions, including climate change, biodiversity loss, and so on. And the reason why we can do this is because science is now carried out by a multi-brain, multi-generational superorganism, um, connected through the internet, connected to the in internet of things, the internet of industrial things. And this has created a collective genius and group intelligence that's capable of co-creating solu solutions to the most intractable problems. So I'm optimistic about the future, and I trust you've enjoyed this quick oversight. Thank you. Thank you very much, like I said, and we'll move over to the question and answer session. Uh, there's nothing in the chat section at the moment, but please use the reaction tools that Zoom so kindly provided us with, or just wave or jump up and down, and I will... Um, give you a chance to uh, ask a question if there are any uh, in the chat at the moment um, there's only thanks and lots of memories and brilliant talk uh, Andy Klee you have a question there we go Andy the screen's all yours uh, oh sorry Andy but please um, type your question in the chat section and I will ask it with all the pleasure in the world basically uh, Andy's question, uh, have you thought about using film as one of your art medium? Yes, we, we have used film. Um, in fact, right back to my days at Lake Sabaya, we made a National Geographic film there on the breeding behavior of, of crocodiles. And I've since been involved with uh, several international um, TV channels, uh, including Geo and National Geographic and, and, and others. Um, mainly on the coelacanth story because that tends to capture the people's imagination because it's really one of the great adventures in science and happened right here in South Africa. Um, I'm working uh, with Marika Becker at the moment. We, we finished a, a documentary on the life and work of Marjorie Courtney Latimer based on my book, uh, which is actually now um, available um, on a documentary uh, on, on TV on Showmax. And we're just finishing off a documentary on the life and work of JLB and Margaret Smith. Um, we've just got to photograph the Dakota at the local Estaflot Air Force Base, and then that'll be finished, and that'll also uh, go on Showmax. And then I, I work quite a lot with Hans Fricke um, as well uh, on various forms, but all once again, mainly on the coelacanth. Wonderful. Thank you, Prof. Marty, screen's all yours. Uh, thanks very much, uh, Professor, for the interesting talk, and I think we all learned a lot. Um, the, the one question that I have is, I'm just intrigued, with the eyesight of a coelacanth, is it good or bad? Or And I mean, th th from what I understand, they're very um, deep sea dwellers. I mean, you were saying, I think, 190 meters down. Um, normally when they found those sort of fish um, so deep, they almost have no eyes. They've um, evolved to have, have no eyes. So I was just interested because they look like they have large eyes. And so that's just a question I've got. Yeah, uh, thanks for that question. Um, of course, we need to put the, the oceans in perspective. Now we're often considered told that the oceans cover two thirds of the surface of the, the globe. The more important sp uh, statistic is that 95% of the livable volume on the planet is under the sea, is in the oceans. Because the oceans here are more than 10,000 meters deep, uh, have an average depth of about three and a half thousand meters. So coelacanths, which tend to live from about 150 to 800 meters, are relatively shallow water fishes by ocean standards. Um, off the Comores at 200 meters, we can read a newspaper in the, in the, in the, in the submersible. There's a lot of light. But um, 
they do not have good eyesight. Uh, in fact, we think they can just determine shades of gray um, and they, they make little, very little use of their eyes in, in hunting because uh, they are using sensors that are unfamiliar to us, you know, detecting the electrical field of play, prey and, and, and uh, feeling vibrations um, in the water. Um, so yeah, their eyesight is, is not good and they are, are certainly you know, not using it extensively for hunting prey. But they are capable of catching fish up to a meter long and, 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 and squid. So they, they are f effective predators, uh, but not using eyesight. I'm just interested in that over time that the eyes haven't kind of become vestigial or something like that, that they seem to be fairly large if you look at the size of their body. I think it's still important for them to know, you know, what the um, light level is, whether it's day or night and so on, because that will also in influence the ability of their prey to see them. Uh, so they, they need that information in order to make their, their hunting effective. Um, uh, it wouldn't be in their benefit for the eyesight to disappear completely. That, that only makes sense when you're really deep down with abyssal fishes where there's no light to speak of except light that's actually produced by living organisms. Okay, no, thank you. And if I can maybe just ask one, one further question and it's pretty impossible to answer, so I'm not trying to, but I mean, up till these fish were discovered, you know, people thought that they had gone extinct. Do you think there are other species of fish that are yet to still be discovered again? Or not again, but you know what I mean? <laughs> Undoubtedly, I mean, just uh, in 1976, which is not too long ago, a, a, a shark, a 16 meter shark, uh, was caught uh, off the USA, which we had no idea existed in the oceans. There are giant squid out there, uh, which um, you know we haven't caught yet, uh, but there has been various uh, bits of evidence about uh, their existence. But once one bit of ev evidence was actually refuted in that a whale was found with uh, squid sucker marks a meter wide on it. And that would extrapolate up into an absolutely <laughs> enormous squid. Mm -hmm. But it was subsequently found that um, when a baby whale gets attacked by a squid and uh, small sucker marks are made on its skin, those sucker marks actually grow bigger uh, <laughs> as a whale gets bigger. So one's got to be careful in interpreting the data. But I have no doubt that there are many, many more discoveries to be made in the oceans. And just on Latimeria alumni, we think it's more widely distributed than we currently know. And Monadoensis probably the same. And there could well be other living species of coelacanths still on the planet that we haven't found yet. Thanks very much. Thank you, Morty. Wonderful. Any other question? Chris, you, you gave a wave there. Or would you, were you just... Uh... No, I was just acknowledging Marty. Oh, okay. uh, he, he's, he always asked very interesting questions. I enjoyed Thanks, Marty. That's all. Thank you. Brian, could I comment on the com uh, Felicity Elmore's... Um, yes, please. please. Please, please, please. Uh, she says, silicones fascinate me. I grew up in Grahamstown, heard a talk by Heinz Fricker in the monument. Now, that was a, a, a quite a historic talk because uh, Hans had just recently returned from the Camorres and had captured the first ever uh, live footage of a living coelacanth. And in the uh, monument in Grahamstown, there was an audience of over 900 people and he had had them absolutely spellbound. And there were actually people in tears. It was such a moving and dramatic event. Uh, at that time, Margaret Smith was ill and in fact would die just a few weeks later. And, and uh, Hans and I went down to the hospital um, in Port Elizabeth and with the permission of the authorities, we showed Hans's film to her on the wall prior, and she watched from her hospital bed. And I'll never forget the end of that. She said, Mike, the, the loop is closed. I'm ready to die now because now having seen a living coelacanth, I've seen everything I ever wanted to see. Incredible. That, that's incredible. What a story. Wonderful. It's lovely to have an audience that, uh, that, can, that can remember and be part of history. Wonderful, thank you. Anyone else that would have like a question or a comment maybe? Jeremiah asked, what is the extinction status of the coelacanth? 
there we go. Was, yeah. Um, we regard the coelacanths as still vulnerable. Um, a specimen that was dissected and examined caught off the Camorse was found to have lethal dotes of DDT and DDE in its flesh. And this is um, insecticide that had blown into the ocean from East Africa. Off Tanzania, we found coelacanths with um, their guts uh, filled with plastic bags, uh, which had caused them uh, to die. And sadly, um, in, in several parts of Africa, but especially in Tanzania, coelacanths are now being deliberately caught again using gill nets and sometimes accidentally caught using gill nets set for shark fin fishing. But we estimate that as many as 80 coelacanths have been netted and killed off Tanzania in the last two decades, which is a horrifying figure, you know, considering their very slow uh, breeding rate and their height on, on the food pyramid. So, um, you know, it would be an absolutely tragic thing if having this fish, having a, um, a group of coelacanths having survived 420 million years, that, you know, within just a few decades of humans discovering them, we cause them to go extinct. But I have a sneaking feeling that in, in a few centuries time, it will be the coelacanth who gives a knowing wink as he watched, uh, watches humans shuffle off this mortal coil. Wonderful, thank you, Prof. Um, anyone else? Any other questions? Uh, love the comment. Liesl van Aas, Professor. Mike, Mike, I share with you, it's, I mean, it's, who's going to rule is going to be planet Earth and not humans. Don't you think it's time for a new effort with, with people making them newly aware of the, the silicon with, mo with modern information? Isn't not people thinking, oh, they've been rediscovered, it's old news, old news. Don't, don't you think it's time for a new effort to make people and the newer generation more aware of the, of the silicon? Well, I'm trying my best and uh, I, I do agree with you. Um, after the discovery of the colony of living coelacanths in the Isimangalisa wetland park in Zululand in 2000, the African coelacanth ecosystem program was launched uh, and that has been managed by uh, SIAB, the Ichthyology Institute in Grahamstown with major contributions from people like Dr. Kerry Sink from Sanby uh, here in Cape Town. Um, and ASEP has been phenomenally successful. It's not only studied coelacanths, but also the habitat and all the other beasts that share that habitat with the coelacanth. It's now in its fifth phase and a lot of publications have come out of that, both uh, in the scientific literature in, in, and in the popular literature. Uh, I think the coelacanth is one of the best known fishes in the ocean actually. Um, and I certainly, plan to continue to, to use its inspiring story to interest people in science and in particular in marine conservation. But I agree with you, it's, it's, a, it's a wonderful handle. I once gave a paper at a museum's conference which was called The Coelacanth is a Mammal. And people were horrified that I'd got my taxonomy all wrong. <laughs> and then I basically gave a paper on marketing. I said that we have milked the coelacanth to such an extent that it must be a mammal. Um, but it, it is a great story and it does help people identify with yeah. marine conservation. Because the coelacanth has become the kind of panda of the seas and um, you know, in conservation and, and in science communication, telling stories which you know have a beginning, a middle and an end and have curious characters along the way is one of the best ways to con communicate science and demystify it. Wonderful. Thank you very much, Diesel. Um, hello, Link Meyer. I do not, uh, do you want to ask a question? I'm going to ask you to unmute, please. Uh, maybe while, while we're making, I can make another point that I feel yes, quite strongly about. You know, traditionally conservation has been carried out by game ranges and game reserves. And that remains extremely important. But in fact, I think the impetus of conservation is now moving to city dwellers in that every one of us has to make a major adjustment to our lifestyle to reduce our carbon emissions, reduce our the use of plastic and so on, because the accumulative effect of 
millions of urban dwellers changing their lifestyle is going to be absolutely massive and will complement the more traditional ways of conserving uh, you know, what I call the fabulous fur balls, the mammals and the extrovert reptiles, the birds, uh, and all the other species that we tend to focus our attention on. Very true, very true. Hello, let's try once more. I'm going to ask you to- Thank you, Mr. Bruton, very much for this enlightening talk. It's fascinating. And also the research and the pictures, um, I think they were so touching really to see these young um, uh, fish swimming around. I mean, these are pictures that one could not even dream of. And then I also appreciate very much your insight that information is not enough. It needs to be actually lived and become part of a wisdom of living. Thanks very much for your talk. Thank you. Thank you very much, Hala. And then um, I would like just to, I'm going to read Ricky Stone's uh, comment in the chat. Uh, what many listeners might not know is that Brock Bruton was an expert witness in the litigation against Shell et al. His testimony ah. in the interdict clearly swayed Judge Bloom um, as to the real concerns such as seismic surveys may present to ancient species. Many thanks again, again Professor. Mm -hmm. Ricky Stern from Cullinan and Associates. Ricky, thank you very much for that, that comment. That is really an important point to make. And to Professor Bruton. You know, one, one of the observations I made in my um, expert witness report is with, you know, we tend to think using the human senses and we tend to forget that fishes and other animals living in dense environments in water can sense things much more sensitively than we can, such as uh, vibrations and noise, etc. So we mustn't think that just before, because they're a few hundred meters or maybe a few hundred, a few kilometers away, they can't sense it and be affected by it. We not we need to become a fish and 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 think uh, fish underwater using the senses that they use, not the ones that we use on land. Mm -hmm. yeah, I, I should I should have mentioned that during our work at Lake Sabaya, because the water there was so crystal clear, we made extensive use of scuba and, and hookah uh, gear, despite the fact that there were crocodiles and hippos in the lake. But we got to know the crocs and the hips. Uh, and, uh, you know, we were able to live with them. On many dives, we saw crocodiles swimming overhead. Uh, we had one nasty incident with a hippo, which lifted our boat out of the water. But it, it is possible, even in dangerous environments, if the water is clear, to use diving uh, equipment. And that really uh, enabled us to fully understand the lake. Okay, wonderful. And then uh, any other questions? Uh, if not, I'm going to uh, end the evening. Oh, Liesl van us. There we go. Prof. Mike, on, on the diving, did you never ever then dive in your Kavanga? Because sometimes, I mean, the water, he puts some crocs there as well, because I know um, Brad Bestemink and the younger chaps, they started diving. So did you guys never ever dive then in your Kavanga? Uh, yes, we certainly did. Uh, we didn't ever have scuba in the Okavango, but uh, we used uh, snorkels. But it is quite hazardous because there are lots of crocodiles in the Okavango and there are all sorts of places that they can lurk unseen. Um, I very nearly drowned in the Okavango once because I wanted to look under the floating papyrus mats, which is a, a habitat that's hardly been explored. And these papyrus mats move around. And what I did is I went under the papyrus mat and then I came up for breath in a hole uh, in the mat and then went down again. And when I came up for breath, that hole had closed. Oh. And I was in a desperate situation, you know, several tens of meters from the nearest open water and I very, very nearly drowned. Uh, so it's actually quite a hazardous place to dive, but the, the visibility is fantastic and seeing things like tiger fish underwater is something you'll never forget. And one of the things we discovered in the Okavango uh, using snorkels, and this was up at, um, at Shikawi, is we discovered the breeding method of the African pike, which make a, a very unusual foam nest in which they lay their eggs. And then the, when the eggs hatch, little juveniles drop down and hang underneath 
the foam nest. And I, I was the first one to find this. I was swimming along and I saw this bit of foam and I thought, oh, you know, someone's been doing their washing with cold water Omo. <laughs> but then when I had another closer look, I saw two adult pike hovering underneath the foam and looked closer and there were the juveniles. And we subsequently did a detailed study and were able to document this very unusual um, foam nesting habit using snorkel. I get that. Absolutely brilliant. Wonderful. Thank you, Prof and Prof. Um, any other questions? If not, then I think, uh, Chris, you waved your no hand. questions. I see you moving towards the end. Yes. Germans has got an expression for somebody who's very experienced mm -hmm. saying that this person has been washed in many waters. So I want to say, Prof. Mike Bruton, you have been washed in many waters. And I can only just from my side say, what, uh, what an incredible privilege to listen to somebody like you and for your presentation. And well done to your life work. It, uh, it grabs me when I, when I meet people like you, and it's your life work, and it's so incredibly deep and intense and will be carried forward into centuries. Thank you very much from my side. Thank you. Thank you much, Chris. I appreciate that. Something I didn't have a chance to talk about is I spent three months in Tiberias doing research on the uh, Lake Tiberias, the Sea of Galilee, and that was a fantastic experience, you know, diving and, and, and fishing off these famous biblical sites. Um, uh, you, you know, as, a, as an aquatic scientist, you do get tend, tend to get washed by many waters. <laughs> <laughs> well done for that. Well done. If there's no other questions, uh, we end off with Mareka. Um, there's someone that says we need a Prof. Bruton session two, three and more. And I believe that is true. And on that note, I want to thank Professor Bruton again and everyone um, that has joined in tonight. Uh, it was a wonderful lecture. Thank you very much. Uh, good, or good, good evening. If you're in South Africa, good morning, good afternoon or good evening or wherever you are in the world. Have a wonderful evening and see you next week, Thursday for our next installment of Unlocking Nature. It's been wonderful to have you all. And thank you very much again to Professor Bruton. <laughs>